Presented by Caltech. Earlier this year, uh, Caltech scientists announced the probable presence of a ninth planet. We are lucky to have one of the paper's authors uh, as our general session speaker today. Dr. Batigan um, was born in Russia but received uh, his education in multiple places, but uh, he got his undergraduate uh, degree at UC Santa Cruz, but he got his master's degree and his PhD here at Caltech and I think he's never left. Um, in 2015, Constantine landed a spot on Forbes' list of 30 under 30, young scientists who, in addition, uh, who are changing the world. Uh, the magazine called him the next physics rock star. Uh, it is a most apt description, since in addition to spending time with his wife and young daughter, he moonlights as the lead singer in the band The Seventh Season. It has been my great pleasure to get to know this very engaging young man and to introduce him to him today. He will be addressing why he and his colleagues think there is probably a ninth planet in our solar system. Dr. Patigan. All right. How do I turn this on? Can you hear me? Oh, excellent. All right. Well, it's. Uh, it's my true pleasure uh, to be here today. I'm delighted and frankly um, starstruck and humbled to be talking to this group of people. Um, so today I'd like to take um, a few minutes to talk about, uh, well maybe a few tens of minutes, to talk about uh, a subject for which I've developed quite an affection, which is uh, the orbital architecture of our own solar system, in particular its most distant realms. Now, um, astronomy, of course, being sort of one of the oldest forms of natural science has enjoyed a long and dramatic history, but it was only kicked into high gear, uh, astronomy as we know it in current form, uh, really 400 years ago when Galileo adopted the telescope and we became no longer limited by the resolving power of the human eye. And what's further fascinating is that despite the kind of breaking down this limitation, the search for you know, additional faint wandering stars that uh, walk around the night sky has been pretty unproductive in the solar system. In the last 400 years, sheer numbers wise, we've only discovered two planets that the ancient civilizations were not aware of. And the first such planet was discovered actually during the American Revolutionary War in 1781 by Sir William Herschel, and he called it George, so you can have Jupiter, Saturn, George. <laughs> and uh, the international astronomical community of the time said that's a bad name for a planet, so <laughs> we have, we, let's call it Uranus, because that's a better name. Um, <laughs> and what, yeah, so the fascinating thing is that almost immediately, astronomers and mathematicians of the time noticed that George was not behaving uh, correctly. In fact, George was, uh, was doing the wrong thing. Its orbit was reconstructed upon discovery from previous kind of serendipitous observations when astronomers drew it but didn't recognize that it was a, an actual moving star. And they noticed immediately that it was deviating from its uh, purely uh, envisioned Keplerian orbit. And Alexis Bouvard, who was the observer, uh, director of the Observatoire de Paris in uh, 1821, published this set of astronomical tables, which uh, I'm sure is, is apparent uh, from this <laughs> slide. There is uh, cosines and sines on the left-hand side and a table on the right-hand side. Um, and what he pointed out was that, look, it's just, you know, if you combine all of the observations of the time together, is you, there's no way to reconcile Uranus's orbit with just the two perturbing pl big planets, Jupiter and Saturn. So as a good theorist, he didn't rule out the possibility that the data is crappy. Um, <laughs> but he also speculated somewhere in here, I don't speak French, so it's, I'm, I'm only guessing that it's in the overall this <laughs> slide, um, that you know, perhaps there's a different uh, additional massive planet that lives beyond the orbit of Neptune. And it wasn't for an additional two decades before the promise of Bovard's data really came to fruition, and it was 
Um, it was really worked out by this guy, Orban Le Verrier, who lived between 1811 and 1877, who um, you know, took, took this idea, right, that uh, you know, there's, there's a different uh, additional perturber uh, residing in the solar system and worked it out. So by uh, probably with a lot of uh, wine and uh, a lot of uh, you know, papers in his Parisian apartment, uh, he, he just worked out and predicted the existence of Neptune beyond, uh, beyond Uranus. Now, when I was an undergrad in Santa Cruz, I lived in sort of a shady part of town, so I can spot a gangster from afar. And this guy is clearly a gangster, you can tell, because uh, he's wearing his bling on the outside, right? <laughs> it's important that his stage name is Urban, Urban Leveria. I mean, he's, he's, he's a gangster. So, uh, this is actually part of the manuscript where he details the, uh, the derivation of, of how to resolve Uranian irregularities with uh, introduction of, of Neptune. And uh, what he also proved was that I don't have the worst handwriting in astronomy in history. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so what's remarkable is that after this discovery, which took place in 1846, and by the way, Neptune, when it was uh, finally observationally confirmed, it was confirmed in just a single night of observation. Gal, who was an observational astronomer in Berlin, uh, sort of mapped and made this multi-year plan, campaign to look for Leverrier's predicted planet, and uh, opened up the telescope and said, oh, well, there, there it is. Um, <laughs> So it was kind of one of the most remarkable uh, examples of, uh, of you know, where theory meets observations. But in the last 170 years, despite numerous attempts to relive and reconstruct these types of calculations, the solar system uh, has failed to produce additional planets. What we have found, however, is a field of debris that lives beyond the orbit of Neptune. So, there's Mercury, Venus, um, there's Earth in blue, my house right here. Uh, there's Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, so George, Neptune. Um, this big blue thing is the orbit of Pluto. I don't know why it's there. It's, uh, you know, pl P for Pluto, the P in Pluto stands for not a planet. Um, you know, Pluto really is, is smaller than the moon, so uh, I think it's, it's correct that my, my friend and colleague, Mike Brown, really pulled the plug on its planetary status. Uh, but what's interesting is Pluto, it turns out, is just one fragment in this big belt of debris, which we now collectively call the Kuiper Belt. What we will see shortly are all of the orbits of the Kuiper Belt. And when we turn our viewing angle back to, to sort of a top view, you'll see that the Kuiper Belt um, has this unifying feature, and this uni unifying feature is that most of these orbits can be, well, most of this, these orbits, virtually all of them, are tethered to the orbit of Neptune, right? They physically hug the orbit of Neptune. Um, the reason this is the case is that Neptune was the thing that produced the Kuiper belt, right? The gravitational potential is conservative, so if you're Neptune and you kick an object, it's gonna go out on its elliptical orbit, but it's gonna come back to exactly where it started from. So that's why all of these orbits hug the orbit of Neptune. So when the Kuiper belt was first discovered, one of the kind of key elements, uh, key things that we learned was that it totally makes perfect sense, right? Its, its orbital structure is complicated, but it can all be understood within the framework of our eight planet solar system. We even learned things about how our solar system formed from mapping out the structure of the Kuiper belt, except for one object. And this one object was discovered by my friend Mike Brown um, back in 2003. This object called Sedna, 2003 VB112, oh, sorry, VB12. Right, so you can immediately, I mean, you don't have to be an expert in the Kuiper belt to understand that this is different from this, right? Uh, <laughs> Sedna, at its furthest point, goes out to almost a thousand times the different distance between the Earth and the Sun. Uh, so it's got this exceptionally elongated orbit. What's even more remarkable about its orbit is that it's not elongated enough, right? At perihelion, it doesn't hug the orbit of Neptune. Neptune could not have, by itself, produced this object. 
So back in 2003, with data point of one, uh, there was quite a bit of speculation. Maybe this was an object that was dropped off by a, uh, by a passing star. Maybe there's a Earth mass planet over here or, or over here. You know, with, with one data point, it's hard to say anything useful. But it was really two years ago when I um, just started here as, uh, as a professor, as uh, was already mentioned, I was a grad student here before that. Uh, so when I came back as a faculty member, you know, Mike and I sort of got back to work together. Um, and really, he, he was the one who pointed me to this and said, let's do, let's figure out what's going on in the, in the distant solar system. So really, the first thing we noticed was that if you just look at the most distant orbits, in the solar system, of which uh, there are now six, there are now six Sedna-like orbits, they all kind of point to the left, okay? Uh, and moreover, they all sort of lie in the same plane. So if we put ourselves in the ecliptic plane, you can almost envision putting a piece of paper through that collection of orbits. And uh, you know, if you've ever done an open water swim, right, you, uh, you'll have good intuition for isotropy. Right? There's no reason why all of these orbits should point in one direction, right? In fact, um, you know, this is, it's surprising to me that this point had eluded uh, the field for as long as it had. So we thought, okay, well, maybe, just maybe, uh, this is just observational bias. Maybe observers you know, only looked in that part of the sky and somehow picked out orbits that all point to the same direction. Turns out, each one of these guys was discovered by a different survey, different telescope even, with different observational biases. Thought maybe we got lucky. Maybe we just happened to pick out six orbits and uh, you know, they all sort of happened to point in the same direction. And of course, by you can evaluate the statistical uh, significance of that. You can evaluate the probability that this is all by chance, and that clocks in at 0.007 percent. So uh, it's not a great gamble. Uh, some of the the quantitative investors will, will you know, can, can make can comment further on this. Um, and importantly, this could not be some relic from the past. Right? If you invoke some stellar encounter in the, during the sun's birth, uh, you would not see this observed structure because if you just leave these orbits alone under the influence of the known giant planets, in a few hundred million years, they will randomize. So it's something is keeping them together right now. So uh, in the next couple hours, I wanna go through uh, <laughs> this derivation and you know, I usually put up this slide as a joke, you know, um, but I'm guessing this is, this is the wrong audience to be joking about this because this is a, <laughs> you guys might actually enjoy it. Um, but the point here is that, you know, you can get started in virtually the same way that Leverrier um, had. You can do perturbation theory and come up with a, with a Hamiltonian which provides a pretty good approximation to the long-term evolution of these orbits. And you, what you can learn just uh, by doing stuff on the board is that if there is indeed a planet, it has to be pretty massive. It's got to be at least um, a few times more massive than the Earth, more like 10. And its orbit will be unlike the orbits of the planets that we have grown to know and love. It will be highly eccentric. So despite the feeling you might get at times watching the news, it is no longer 1846, so we don't have to do the entire calculation on, on paper, we can resort to the, uh, to the vast uh, and um, awesome computational resources that we have here uh, at Caltech. So we decided to do a bunch of evolutionary calculations, right? Let's start the solar system in the configuration that it had four and a half billion years ago when the Kuiper belt just formed as this axisymmetric collection of eccentric orbits and evolve it forward in time under the influence of the known planets plus a putative planet, planet nine. So um, we ended up doing just a ton of these calculations. So, so there's no shortage of, of bad results. If you guys are ever in need of bad results, I can provide you with bad results. Um, 
But what we, began, what we began to notice is that, much like what, the, what those analytic calculations had suggested, if you put a 10 Earth mass planet on an eccentric orbit whose perihelion, closest approach to the sun, is at about 250 AU, 250 times the distance between the Earth and the sun, over a period of four billion years, what this planet will do is it'll start carving out a population of orbits which will, in the end, resemble the ones that we, we really have. And it's, it's a fascinating thing because it, it actually does take four billion years for, this to, uh, for the structure to emerge. It's right around now, which is about two and a half billion years into the evolution, that you begin to see that only the orbits that are anti-aligned with respect to the orbit of the planet are surviving, and there's still some stragglers over here. Um, so, you know, every time I watch this, I know what the final answer is, but I'm still like, will, will it really happen? You know, <laughs> will it really happen? You know, so to quote Kanye, you know, I'm gonna I'm let you finish. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, in the end, you know, the, the thing you produce is, is that these gold orbits are like the conventional Kuiper belt, right? They're, they're evenly distributed, and these distant guys are, are anti-aligned. One of the things that surprised us right away, both Mike and I said, how the heck are these things stable? And all of these orbits intersect. Um, how, do you, how do they avoid suffering close encounters with Planet Nine and getting ejected? In the end, that's how the rest of the orbits got ejected. What's keeping these guys confined? And the, um, the answer, as it turns out, can be deduced from our insignificant friend Pluto. Pluto also <clears throat> crosses the orbit of Neptune, but is protected from ever coming too close to it, suffering close encounters by a mean motion resonance, meaning that or, uh, Pluto's orbit and Neptune's orbit are in these, share this clockwork-like relationship where for every three orbits that Pluto completes, Neptune completes, no, sorry, for every two that Pluto completes, Neptune completes exactly three. And so they, they kind of avoid seeing each other. And as it turns out, all of these orbits are resonant with Planet Nine, only this time the resonances are much more exotic and are in fact chaotic. So if you leave this system alone, they maintain the overall orientation, but the orbits are changing in an unpredictable manner all the time. So at this point, we had a pretty good uh, pretty good sense for what the orbit of Planet Nine would look like based on the real object. It's gotta be like this. Um, we know that it's not in the uh, closer half, maybe closer two thirds of its orbit. Presently, at, it's closer to aphelion. That's what you would expect anyway from a Keplerian orbit because by Kepler's second law, you spend most of your time far away from the sun. So we, we felt pretty good about ourselves, and then we ran into this total, uh, total block, which, was, which, which is nicely summarized in this slide. Um, you know, this is a huge problem, right? What we have here is on the x-axis, this is basically the, the azimuthal orientation of the orbits. On the y-axis is the orbital inclination. And what we noticed is that every time we reproduce our cluster of distant things, uh, in the solar system, we also produce a population of orbits that had been twisted on their side. You know, the orbit the sun in an almost perpendicular sense compared to the disk of the solar system. And I'm just a simple theorist, but I remember learning in elementary school that in the solar system, things go roughly like this. They don't go, they don't go like that. <laughs> um, so I, I, was, I was really stumped and Mike was uh, stumped for a little bit, and then Mike said, you forgot about 2012 DR30. And I had indeed, well, I'd never heard of 2012 DR30, but um, <laughs> I thought maybe that was an experimental drug or something. Um, and what Mike said, I remember learning that 2012 DR30 has an inclination of 78 degrees. Okay, um, so what we did, um, one afternoon in his office, we said, okay, let's, let's put all of the model predictions and just uh, you know, do, the, do the honest thing, not look at the data, and then let's plot not just the Kuiper Belt data, but all of the data that we have in the solar system, uh, small body catalog. And what we found is that indeed, there exist 
these little guys, uh, these tiny pieces of debris that orbit the sun in an almost perpendicular sense. And they had all been discovered only within the last couple years entirely by accident. They had been discovered by a near-Earth asteroid survey because the near-Earth asteroid survey does not discriminate based upon where in the sky the killer asteroid will come from. Right? It's going to be a very embarrassing last couple hours of your life when you kind of try to explain to the world, you know, we, uh, well, we, we, we searched over there and there was no killer asteroid, but uh, it came from over there, right? <laughs> so um, this is a stark contrast with Kuiper Belt surveys. Kuiper Belt surveys only look in the ecliptic plane, which is why these objects had, uh, had eluded observation. So as it turns out, what our model was predicting, this population of, of perpendicular orbits, it really is out there, and I think this is actually the strongest line of evidence for the existence of Planet Nine, because there's no other way in hell to produce orbits in the solar system that are, that are twisted up. Um, so this is what they look like in, in real space. These are the real objects. Notice that this guy over here is even more extreme than Sedna, right? We thought Sedna was weird. This guy has a semi-major axis greater than um, 1,000 AU, so out here it's going out to almost 3,000. Quite an incredible set of objects. Um, we have now, by the way, uh, I'm gonna send myself on a tangent. Um, <clears throat> we've, we've understood the physics by, by which this twisting happens, uh, and it's an effect which had actually been known since the early 1960s, uh, called the Kozai effect, and it had been uh, pointed out in the asteroid belt as well, but be even before that, it had been pointed out by a Russian guy named Lidov in the late 50s because the first Russian satellites came crashing down into the Earth, Earth's atmosphere because the potential of the, the average kind of mean field potential of the moon would twist them and, and be, make them more eccentric. So when we published the paper, we cited Co the Kozai paper, but not the Lidov paper, and I got an email recently from a Russian guy that said, come to, Kulinan, uh, to uh, Kaliningrad, I punch you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on that note, what the heck is Planet Nine? Planet Nine is, is an object which looks, uh, until it's caught on camera, I can make up what it looks like. And it's, uh, it looks exactly like this. It's got one, two, three lightning storms. Uh, <clears throat> it's got an orbital period of 20,000 years, a mass about 10 times that of the Earth. We actually have uh, constrained this number pretty well since the original publication. We really do think it's 10, it's not 20, it's not five. Um, the radius we must only guess based upon radius mass relationships that exist for planets around other stars, exoplanets, but we think it's, it's kind of like Neptune's, between two and, Earth, uh, two and four Earth radii. Um, it's got a wildly eccentric orbit, 0.6, which is quite in a, in a stark contrast with, with the rest of the nearly circular orbits of, uh, of our planets, quite, quite inclined as well and it's got a visual magnitude of 24. So if you're an astronomer, you, I think I heard somebody go, ooh. Uh, so visual magnitude 24 is, uh, is pretty dim, okay? But it's not as dim, it's not so dim that it's undiscoverable. In fact, there's basically one telescope on Earth that is perfectly suited for the search, observational search for Planet Nine. Uh, and it's this guy right here, the Subaru Telescope, Japanese National Observatory. It's an eight meter telescope, and uh, you know, 24th magnitude is, is well within its capabilities given, you know, so we'll have to have about 20 nights on the Subaru Telescope to complete our, our search area. So this is Mike and myself in the Subaru, um, in the Subaru Dome. It's huge. I had, you know, I never really observed before, and I didn't, didn't appreciate the extent to which this thing is a behemoth. Um, <clears throat> and uh, because you guys are my home crew, I'll, uh, I'll tell you where Planet Nine is. So <laughs> this is the night sky, I'm told, and uh, <laughs> this guy right here is the Orion constellation. My cat's name is Orion, so this is one of the constellations that I actually do know. Um, and over here, this star uh, goes through Orion's shield. Now, depending on which, um, 
which picture of Orion you look at is either holding a sword or, or a shield or sometimes a bow, but Planet Nine's aphelion is right here. So that's where you gotta look, okay? So this, guy, this way you guys can, uh, can tap into your inner hipster for when it's found, say, oh yeah, I, I knew it was, I knew it was, really, <laughs> I knew it was way, way before it was popular. A uh, Couple last thoughts about Planet Nine. Uh, what does Planet Nine mean for our solar system? Well, it turns out, Planet Nine is the least weird thing about our solar system. Uh, it's, it's the thing that makes our solar system fit in better into the galactic planetary census. With its high eccentricity of 0.6, it fits better into the overall orbital distribution of, of planets in general than our circular orbits that scrape the bottom of this plot. In the last 20 years, we've discovered more than 3,000 planets that orbit other stars, and, and they don't tend to look like the solar system. We are, we are the anomaly, so to speak, and, and Planet Nine is perhaps our link to the extrasolar world. I sometimes like to say that Planet Nine is our solar system's exoplanet. And uh, final thought is that the thing that kept us up at night was that maybe we made all of this up, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of, you know, as a, as a scientist, you try not to believe yourself too much. And we thought maybe we, you know, kind of subconsciously constructed all of our, of our statistics to, to tell us that indeed this is all relevant. And after all, statistics is just another way that human beings lie to one another. So we were really worried that, you know, the next set of orbits that would be discovered in the Kuiper Belt would, you know, make this cluster go away and, uh, and then we'd be, we'd be pretty embarrassed. But the good news is, since then, uh, objects have been discovered and they all fall exactly where our model predicts them to be. This is an example of a new orbit that's been discovered by uh, a Canadian survey. And the reason the picture looks so bad is that somebody in, uh, in Mountain View took a picture of somebody else's talk uh, and then posted it on Twitter and then I screenshot, uh, screen captured the Twitter. <laughs> so, so that's the, the true new, new methods of celestial mechanics. Um, I'm not gonna go through this. I will, uh, I will simply put up a picture. This is my friend, mentor, and colleague, and sometimes workout buddy, Mike Brown, uh, with whom I have the pleasure uh, of, of working. And also, I wanted to acknowledge uh, people working in my group, Catherine Deck, Chris Spaulding, Henry No, Natalia Storch, Peter Bueller, and Elizabeth Bailey. They were not directly involved in this work, but still, uh, my daily experiences at Caltech would not be the same uh, without the awesome dynamic conversations that I have with these guys and girls, they're awesome. So at this point, I wanna say thank you.